Good morning. I am Dr. M. A. Ali, consultant in critical care medicine, Apollo Hospital, Jupiter. In next 20 minutes, I am going to talk about the intracranial hemorrhage. How to approach a patient presenting with intracranial hemorrhage? So, a 45 years old male presented the ED via the ambulance at 9:53 p.m. with complaints of disorientation, slurred speech, facial drop, right-sided weakness. Stroke pathway is activated, stroke triage. The last time the patient was normal at 6.30 p.m. and the onset of time of the symptoms is 7 p.m. On examination, patient was drowsy. Following commands, right-sided weakness was present. Stirring of speech, right facial uh, drop was there. And the patient is confused. GCS was 14. And the blood glucose level was 109. Our vitals... Blood pressure are 198 by 100, heart rate was 83, saturations are 98, IV cannula is placed and the labs were drawn and the, the uh, CBP, PT, EBT, INR and the metabolic panel was sent, blood grouping and typing was done and a screening was done. So there is a past history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, sleep apnea and recently the patient is started on comedine for atrial fibrillation. There was no history of trauma, surgery or stroke or intracranial hemorrhage. The CT scan was done. And meanwhile, ECG and chest x-ray was done. The CT scan showed acute intraparenchial hemorrhage at, at, at left basal ganglia. It is about 3.2 to 1.5 centimeters extending into the left ventricle. A small amount of blood was observed in the right ventricle and, and third ventricle. The lapse comes comes normal except the INR, which is 2.1. So, what can go wrong with this patient at this situation? So, there may be risk of herniation and brainstem compression, airway compromise, hematoma expansion, elevation of intracranial pressures, and secondary brain injury from scissor, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, or fever. The intracranial hemorrhage is defined as spontaneous bleeding within the brain parenchyma that may extend into the ventricles and subarachnoid space. Depending upon the locations, it is called deep cerebral intracerebral hemorrhage, lobar intracerebral hemorrhage, interventricular hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, and extradural hemorrhage. So, most common cause of intracerebral hemorrhage is the hypertension and about constitute about 60% of the cases of ICH. The other causes are arteriogulatory dysfunction, like reperfusion injury, hemorrhagic transformation of the ischemic stroke, arteriopathies, cerebral ang amyloid angiopathy, altered hemostasis from the thrombosis or anticoagulation, which can cause, and hemorrhagic necrosis from the tumor and infections, venous outflow obstruction, cerebral venous thrombosis, sympathetic drugs like cocaine and amphetamine. The case pattern is extremely high and the mortality is by the one year is 60%. Only 20% of the patient who survive are dependent, independent within six months. Around 20,000 20, deaths annually observed in the US and around 30 day mortality is around 44%. And in pontine and brainstem hemorrhage, it was 75%. Coming to pathophysiology of intracranial hemorrhage, it is a dynamic and complex process. Because of the hypertension, there will be damage to the endothelial, vascular endothelium, and which results in the rupture of blood pressure when rupture of blood vessels when the blood pressure was high. After that, the blood leakage into the parenchyma, brain parenchyma, and forms a hematoma. As the blood pressure persistently elevated and there was a persistent leak of the blood, there was a hematoma expansion. It occurs around one to twenty-four hours usually. And, and after, as the hematoma release of a lot of hematoma releases, a lot of inflammatory mediators, which can cause edema to, by after 24 to 72 hours. Usually, we observe early deterioration in these in the patient with ICH. It is because more than 20% will experience drop in the GCS of two or more between the EMS and ED initial evaluation. Around 15 to 23 percent demonstrate continuous deterioration first few hours after the ICH first CT. So the hematoma expansion is because of the active bleeding that may proceed for hours after the symptoms onset. 
and increases the risk of poor functional outcome and today about 28 to 38 percent have hematoma expansion of greater than one third of the initial hematoma volume on the follow-up CT. You can see around the percentage of hematoma expansion is more in the zero to three hours. Later, gradually reduces after 24 hours. The chance of hematoma expansion is very less. Though the patient usually presents with focal neurological deficit, headache in 40% of the patient and 40 to 50% of the patient present with nausea and vomiting. The decreased level of consciousness observed in 50% of the patients and the elevated blood pressure was found in 90% of the patients and the seizures in 6 to 7%. So how to manage these patients in the emergency department? We considered this as a golden hour and perform a rapid neurological examination, follow the ABC and stabilize it, and diagnose and calculate the ICS score, ICS score if possible, classify the type of hemorrhage, correct the coagulopathy, manage the blood pressure, communicate with the team, get the patient to the right place. The first our checklist are complete blood count and repeated count, PT, ABT, INR, and blood glucose level. Head injury imaging like hematoma size, location, presence of intraventricular hemorrhage, GCS score, calculate the IAC scores, and the intervention like coagulopathy re reversal, blood pressure lowering, surgical hematoma evacuation, airway and ventilation. So make sure that while transporting the CT, the airway is protected and there should not be any hypoxia. The gold standard test for the diagnosis of intracranial hemorrhage is the non-contrast CT scan, which shows an hyperintense areas in the parenchyma. In CT angiography, if there is a leakage of the blood pressure, uh, a leakage of the contrast, exacerbation of contrast, then there is a high likelihood that these patients will go into hematoma expansion. And, and it may be because of the uh, macrovascular beat. How to calculate the ICS scores? So the, to calculate the size of the hematoma, a greater hemorrhage diameter was taken. And the B is the diameter perpendicular to A. And the C is the CT slices where the hemorrhage is visible and multiplied by this size thickness. So ABC by 2 is the calculation for estimation of ICH volume. The score each with the each in, is increase in the score, ICH is associated, ICH score is associated with increased risk of mortality and morbidity. It should not be used for uh, prognosis. It is used for method of communicating the disease activity. Various sites where the uh, ICH is more common, like putaminal hemorrhage, it constitutes about 34%, lobar subcortical hemorrhage, 24%, thalamic bleed, around 20%, pontine hemorrhages, around 6%, and cerebellar hemorrhage, around 7%. Whenever there is a suspicion of ICH, history and history is taken, and non contrast CT should be done. And to assess the ma uh, macrovascular causes of ICH, so there is a uh, assessing the low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. The low risk patients are uh, the chance of IC, uh, the, uh, the, the factors which are, which should be considered old age, history of hypertension, deep location, CD sign of small vessels. These are the low risk. Whereas high risk, younger age group, no history of hypertension, low bar location, no CT signs of small vessel disease, primarily interventricular hemorrhage. These patients, the high intermediate and high risk patients should undergo CT angiography. If there is, if it is positive, the high likelihood of DSA should be positive in more than 50%. If it is negative, then evidence of small vessel is present, then the history of hypertension is present. The, there is less likely of positivity of intra-arterial DSA. Whereas evidence of small vessel disease is not there, then the intermediate possibility of intra-arterial DSA is there. It is 2 to 50%. In the golden hour, there was, we should stabilize and reassess the patient for the patient airway breathing circulation and rapid and accurate diagnosis of neuroimaging, concise clinical assessment regarding the ICS characters and patient's condition, and control of blood pressures, correction of coagulopathy, need of early surgical intervention, anticipate specific patient's care needs, like specific treatment related to ICH, underlying ICH pass, and early clinical deterioration and hematoma expansion, need for ICP and other monitoring. So the main for, uh, way of preventing the hematoma expansion is blood pressure control, reverse of INR, and metabolic control. 
So AHA states that ICH patients with SBP between 10, 150 to 200 with a, a, and without contraindication to acute DP treatment can safely be reduced to 140. And it's shown the functional outcome. ICH patients presenting with SBP more than 220, aggressive reduction of BP with IV medications can be done. The two trials, Interact and Attached 2 trials, which showed that reduction of blood pressure, Interact 2 trials has shown that reduction of blood pressure targeting 140 is safe and it has shown benefit, small benefit, benefit in the functional outcome. And if the blood pressure is reduced to 110 to 130, it, it did not result in lower the death rate or disability than the standard reduction to 140. That pressure. Various drugs are used like levetolol, esmolol, nicardipine, nicardipine, pendopan, and nitrosoprasol. The problem with the nitrosoprasol is that it increases the ICP variable response and myocardialization, thiocyanide, and cyanide toxin. So, coming to correction of coagulation to prevent the hematoma expansion, the patients who are on warfare, uh, they should be treated with Kcentra or fact, four factor prothrombin complex. Profil 9 are three factor prothrombin complex concentrated instead of case and heparin allergy. So, vitamin K is used. In case of dabigatron or Pradexa, the reversal agent is idarucizumab and the dose is 5 grams. Factor A, 10A inhibitors, adenexanate alpha is used only approved for rivaroxaban and epixaban. AJ stated that ICH patients with ICH whose INR is elevated because of vitamin K antagonists. Those should be start, the drug should be stopped and it should be corrected. The INR should be corrected with vitamin K dependent factors or with received uh, or with vitamin K. Prothrombin complex concentration may have fewer complications or correct INR more rapidly than FFP and it should be considered over FFP. A recommended factor 7A does not replace all the factors and so it is not recommended. So for patients with ICH who are taking dabigatron, rivaroxaban, apixaban, treatment with FIBA, other plated uh, prothrombin uh, complex concentration or uh, recombinant activated factor 7 it might be considered on an individual basis. And activated charcoal should be used if the drug is taken less than two hours earlier. FIBA is an anti inhibitory coagulant complex used approved for hemophilia. Idrusumab is a human monoclonal antibody. Five grams is five grams should be given. Two point five grams, uh, fifteen minutes apart, not more than fifteen minutes apart. There was a fast trial which showed that recombinant factor activated factor seven A reduces the growth of hematoma, but did not improve the functional outcome after the intracellular hemorrhage. So, protamine sulfate can be used for reversal of hemorrhage. And platelet transfusion in ICH is uncertain, and it is used only just before uh, for when the patient is taken taking for the surgery when the thrombocytopenia is present. Correction of metabolic factors like uh, avoiding the hyperhypoglycemia, treatment of fever, and systemic screening for MI and ECG cardiac enzyme testing after ICH is reasonable, and formal dysphagia screening before starting work. <coughs> The scissor prophylaxis is not recommended. Scissor should active scissors should be treated with anti-epileptic. Continuous EEG monitoring is required in patients who are like disoriented, disproportionate to the degree of brain injury. And when there is a subclinical scissors, it should be treated with anti-epileptic. DVT is uh, DVT in hematologic patient is around 10 to 15 percent during the hospital stay. Intermediate pneumatic compression must be used immediately. Graduation compression has no role. A heparin can be started after one to four days once the hematoma stabilizes. Coming to the, our patient, change in neurostatus was observed at 10 17 pm and there was increase in dip, uh, increase in drowsiness and there was incompressible speech. A rapid uh, uh, RSI was done to protect the airway and repeat CT was done at 11 pm. It was the repeat CT showed a considerably growing size over one hour. The size was 3.2 into 1.5 to 4.5 into 3.6 centimeters. Blood in all ventricles. Ventricles are enlarged and about 8 mm midline shift was observed and there was a vasogenic edema. So when we should consider the for the surgery? 
is in cerebellar hemorrhages, decline in the neuro neurological uh, examination and the size more than three centimeters, comprehensive effect of brainstem or compressive effects of brainstem or hydrocopolis. When there is a low bar bleed, it, when the mass effect or herniation is severely affected, but salvageable patient are glycine. When we should consider EBD is when the when the ICP is high and the GCS is less than nine, nine. and patients with IVH are risk for hydrocephalus or elevated ICP. So AHA says that EBD uh, as the treatment of hydrocephalus is responsible, especially reasonable, especially in patients with decreased level of consciousness. There are two trials, stage one and stage two. Stage one <coughs> trial where the early surgery did not show overall improved overall benefit from the early surgery when compared to the initial conservative match. But in stage, stage two trial, that showed that early surgery does not increase the rate of death or disability at six, six months. But in patients with super spontaneous superficial intracerebral hemorrhages without interventricular hemorrhage, there is a some benefits was observed. For cerebral edema, all measures should be taken for reducing cerebral edema, mitral, hypertermic saline, head in elevation, all the measures should be taken. And <clears throat> surgery is indicated only for the placement of EVD in cerebellar hemorrhages or relief of ICP with hemicrinectomy. H state that interventricular administration of recombinant TPA in KVH appears to be fairly low complication rate and efficacy and safety of this treatment is uncertain. Efficacy of endoscopic treatment is uncertain. Patient with cerebellar hemorrhages who are deteriorating and because of the brainstem compression or hydrocephalus should undergo surgical removal as soon as possible. Initial treatment of these patients with ventricular drainage rather than with surgical evacuation is not recommended. For most of the patients with supratentorial ICH, usefulness of surgery is not well established. Policy of early hematoma evacuation is not clearly beneficial compared to hematoma evacuation when the patient deteriorates. The MISTI trial, which minimally invasive surgery plus recombinant TPA for ICH evacuation, only few patients where the reduction of hematoma was less than, uh, less than 50, 15 ml showed 10.2% difference in the likelihood of achieving good functional outcome. Restarting of anticoagulation, there is no such timing for, uh, timing is uncertain for restarting uh, of anti anticoagulation. And it, it is advisable to start four weeks of if the patient without, mechan without mechanical valves might decrease the ICS recurrence. Uh, anticoagulation should be avoided, avoided in patients with lower ICH uh, with, in non valvular rate. Coming to summary, medical stabilization and prevention of hematoma expansion. Follow ABC, monitoring the patient's vitals and standardized neurological care, key history and laboratory invest investigation. Prevention of hematoma expansion by reducing the blood pressure, correction of problems, the stopping of anticoagulation, and evidence of increase uh, reducing the ICP. When imaging like non contrast CT scan and CT scan is done, if the etiology is not identified with non contrast CT or CT angiography, the subcortical sub or uh, cortical primary IVs, MRI, MRA, MRV can be helpful. If they are, if they doesn't diagnose, distal subtraction and imaging is helpful. It should be repeated if there is no diagnosis of two weeks. And surgical, so neurosurgical involvement is potential for evacuation and decompression of the patients. Consider EV insertion, hydrocephalus, and prevention of secondary injury if sign and soft evidence of ICP is there. Scissor only when clinically present. General ICU management like early enteral nutrition, avoid hypothermia, hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia, maintain normothermia or DVD prophylaxis. Thank you.